Uh, welcome everyone, my name is Benjamin Eichert. Uh, I'm the director of the Romero Institute's Let's Green California Initiative. And I want to thank you all for coming today. It's really great to have you here at this event. Um, we're actually going to start off today with um, a, a short a few words and a presentation from someone from Senator John Laird's office. So I'd like to uh, ask you to welcome Jonathan up here to the microphone. Ben. Um, I will be brief because I am not Senator Laird, but um, uh, you know, climate change is the existential crisis of our time right now, and it's one that that's going to need an all hands on deck approach. And one of the you know best ways to combat that is to quicken our transition to zero emission vehicles. So I want to thank everyone that's in attendance that you know made this possible, and uh, thank the Romero Institute for all their work and. Uh, yeah, I uh, have the uh, certificate to present somewhere, but um, <laughs> okay. oh, there it is. All right. Well, on behalf of State Senator John Layard, I would just like to present this certificate of recognition to the Romero Institute for all the work they do in ensuring that California has a green and equitable future. So, thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Jonathan, and thank you, Senator Laird. So for my presentation today, I'm actually going to start in the middle of the story. Three days ago, Senate Bill 1230, which is authored by Senator Monique Lamone and sponsored by us and the Dolores Huerta Foundation, passed the Senate Appropriations Committee with a five to one vote. It's going to be headed to the full Senate uh, this coming week and then it's gonna head over to the assembly. But as it was passing the Appropriations Committee, there was actually some bigger news that took place. And that is Senate Bill 1230 was designated as a priority bill by the Senate's Climate Working Group. Yeah. And eight senators joined as co-authors of the bill, including Santa Cruz's own Senator John Lay. So this is really incredible news and we're obviously thrilled. But I want to rewind a little bit. So what is Senate Bill 1230 and why are we moving it? So historically, California has been a climate leader, but unfortunately in recent years, we've fallen off the pace. Reports show that we're not on track to meet our 2030 climate goals until 2060. And unfortunately, we're not alone. Globally, progress toward becoming zero carbon is moving way too slowly. Last year, the Romero Institute in Let's Green California began working on a comprehensive policy vision that aimed to answer the question, what would it actually take for California to meet its climate goals? Just as importantly, how can we do so in a way that lifts up vulnerable communities and ensures that our steps towards sustainability include families on the front lines? We believe it starts with electrification, and the premise of electrification is fairly simple. If we take all the technologies that we're using that are powered by fossil fuels, and we make a transition and we switch to technologies that are powered by electricity, then we can eliminate most of our greenhouse gas emissions. One of the reasons for that is that California has one of the cleanest electricity grids in the country and it's getting greener all the time. In fact, we should thank Senator John Laird for being one of the principal authors on another bill, Senate Bill 1020, which is going to actually speed up our transition to 100% clean and renewable energy in our electricity grid. So electrification is at the core of our policy vision, so much so that we actually called it Electrify California. And Electrify California takes inspiration from American infrastructural achievements of the past. Whether it's economic downturn or war, Americans have always built our way out of crisis, and the climate crisis is no different. Electrify California charts a new course for climate policy in California, one that focuses on building solutions from the bottom up, from the ground up. We put cost and consumers first, we put jobs and workers first, and we put equity and frontline communities first which brings me back to Senate Bill 1230. Even though California is the birthplace of the modern electric vehicle revolution, and electric vehicles are actually our state's number one export from what I understand, 
our adoption rates lag behind other countries, including Norway, the Netherlands, and even China. Additionally, transportation has for decades been a thorn in California's efforts to attain safe, healthy air quality, both in terms of harmful tailpipe pollution, but also in terms of dangerous climate warming gases. For the last several years, our team at Let's Green California and the Romero Institute has conducted outreach and education in low and moderate income communities to help individuals get into clean cars. As Jonathan explained, one of the best ways we can deal with this persistent problem of emissions and transportation is by making a rapid transition away from internal combustion engine vehicles that are powered by gasoline and to zero emission vehicles that are powered primarily by electricity. So we've been doing this outreach in low-income communities, and we've learned that while California has strong programs to support the transition to zero emission vehicles, unfortunately, the landscape is difficult to navigate. There are myriad incentive programs, each of which must be pursued separately with its own timing for approval and use, and often with long waiting periods. In practice, these programs don't meet the needs of low and moderate income residents because A, those people don't have the expendable income or credit to be able to buy a vehicle now and wait and receive a rebate later. And also, they tend to drive their current car until it stops running, which means that when they need a new vehicle, that need is urgent. They can't afford a waiting period. So, a 2016 study by the International Council on Clean Transportation found that the most effective clean car incentive programs are those that are easy for applicants to access and understand and that provide funds for use at the point of sale. Our bill, Senate Bill 1230, will simplify and streamline our state's incentives into a unified one-stop shop and align California's existing clean car programs behind these proven principles. We also found the lack of sufficient electric vehicle chargers in disadvantaged communities creates an additional barrier to adoption. Infrastructure lags, infrastructure build-out lags behind demand and this dynamic actually needs to be flipped. The second part of Senate Bill 1230 calls for an accelerated build-out of charging infrastructure so that enough chargers are built each year to meet demand in subsequent years. It also asks that 50% of charging infrastructure investments go to disadvantaged communities with preference given to sites that are at or near multifamily housing and sites that minimize demand on the electrical grid by incorporating, for example, photovoltaic solar and battery storage. So, in total, Senate Bill 1230 can help ensure that as we pursue our zero emission vehicle goals, working families and frontline communities are at the forefront of that transition. It can help put us on track to achieve California's 2030 Climate Action Plan goals for emissions, reduction in the transportation sector. And finally, it will create good paying jobs and grow the robust, skilled and trained workforce California will require to meet its electrification needs well into the future. Senate Bill 1230 is just the first step, though, in what we understand will be a multi-year effort. By centering our work and the policies that we support on the needs of working families and the victims of environmental injustice, we can grow a broad coalition, one that has the strength to overcome resistance from all corners. We were thrilled that at the hearing of the Senate Environmental Quality Committee last month, the chief lobbyist for the State Electrical Workers Association stood up and urged the committee senators to support our bill. Thank you. We're already beginning to see collaboration between groups that haven't collaborated in the past. We're starting to see uh, mutual support in ways that we haven't seen before. So that's really exciting. Two things that I want to close with. I am really proud to work with this organization. The Romero Institute's leaders, Danny and Sarah, our visionaries. Our partner, Dolores Huerta, is legendary. And the staff that support and lead our work are passionate, dedicated, and inspired. But I'm especially grateful for you, the friends and allies who make this work possible. We're not doing this alone, we're doing it in concert with a community. And you've added your voice to this course and it's resonating beautifully, loudly, and mightily. Heidi Harmon, the former mayor of San Luis Obispo, who now works with us, and as our public affairs director, you know, she always likes to say, together, we are mighty, and I believe her. So thank you for standing with us and acting to create a better world. Now we're off to the assembly. Thank you so much.
now I would like to ask Sarah Nelson, the Executive Director of the Romero Institute. Hi, everybody. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for coming. This is a really exciting day because of these developments this week. And uh, I want to I want to start by by thanking, doing a special thanks to Paul Lee, Dr. Paul Lee, who's with us today. He's the chair of our board. <laughs> Paul has been our dearest friend ever since we began working with him years ago. He's the reason why Danny, he and Faye Crosby, who is here, who's also on our board, there she is. Um, Faye and, and Paul are the reason why Danny has been teaching at the university for a number of years, and not during COVID, but before that, and will most likely return. Uh, he, that means Paul is also the reason that we've had wonderful interns year after year to help us do this work coming from the university. Um, and his history of justice work in this community, of being at the founding of all, if not most, of the environmental communities that have developed here. I mean, he has this incredible, of the founding of the California Conservation Corps, he has been a public servant all of his life. And I would I'd like, invite you to help uh, thank him with another round of applause. And I, I would expand a bit on what Ben said, that this work, which is going very well, in fact is almost miraculous. Uh, I, I want to back up and say for a moment, when we started a couple years ago, we, you, some of you know, we wanted to do a Green New Deal for California that would affect the, move the economy in the direction of a glee, clean and green economy and jobs and would solve the, the, the entire problem of how you get to uh, carbon zero in this state in 10 years, we began to realize as the research really got deep, and Ben was fantastic because he's the one that said, one day I remember we were all sitting there, he said, we can't do a Green Deal. We have to do something about our alliance with labor because labor was saying no consistently to all major environmental Over legislation. Jobs. Well, because there are people that have jobs and they have them in the oil industry. They have them the pipe fitters who put in all the natural gas pipes. Others, there's all these people in the building trades. And what was happening is a lot of people in the other constituencies were really mad at them, you know, because they were blocking. And the thing that we realized, because I have a labor history, Ben has a lot of labor. He's a labor organizer from both the nurses and also SEIU and stuff. And Danny has worked with, with unions in his legal cases. So we, we realized, okay, we have to form a trusting relationship with these folks. They're our brothers and sisters. They made the middle class in the United States of America. They have been getting squished ever since Reagan was elected. They've been shrinking because they're, you know, the, this division between the very few at the top and everybody else is partly increased by weakening and weakening unions, all right? So we said, okay, good. And we started to work. And for months, our team has been working with all the IBEW regional locals so that we could establish trust one-on-one, -on -one, shoulder to shoulder, right here in our own region, and and work together on programs that would help both the environment and 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 the working folks. So, when this fellow stood up, as Ben said, in the Environmental Quality Committee, and said, you know, and he was the lobbyist for for building trades, and he said, I urge you to pass this bill in your committee, and I want you to know that the International Brotherhood of electrical workers supports it. I mean, it was like unbelievable. When I when I said when I, when I said that to Senator Laird, when I said that to Senator Laird at his event, he, he whipped his head around and he said, 
that never happens, <laughs> right? So we're in a new day now. I mean, it's not, and it's not only us, it's not only Let's Be in California and the Romero Institute, there's a couple other really important environmental groups that have figured it out too, that we have to be sitting down at the table with the working, with the leaders of the working people in the state, and we have to figure it out together. The language and, and how it's gonna work for everybody. Because when you get right down to it, you cannot get to carbon zero in the state with a, a handful of people who have figured out how to work the incentives and have a Tesla or a Prius. We're not going to make it. It's not enough people. We have to have everybody participating in going green. Everybody has to electrify. I mean, we, we put panels on our roof this, this last year. I, I mean, if it weren't for Danny Paul, I don't know, we never would have figured out financially how we were going to do this. But we did it because we knew it had to be done. And I'm telling you, our electrical bill is zero. Our elect I looked at it the other day, it's zero for electricity. So it's hard, yes, to figure out how to get them up there, but it's, it's so important. He figured out how to get an electric car. We have a th charger there. So there's another thing that's not happening that you know, it did in the past. He, he drove a fossil fuel car. Danny and I are doing hybrids. We're trying, and we're, we are not in you know, some level of funding that it's easy to do these things, but everybody can do it. If you just say, I'm gonna electrify. I'm gonna electrify my kitchen. I'm gonna electrify my house. I'm gonna electrify my car. I can do that, and if everybody does it, we deal with 40%, 40% of our emissions in this state. So I'm, I'm encouraging you, and, and as Ben is saying, what our job, what we felt our job was, is to make it easier to get the incentives. Make it easier to, go, to electrify. And, and make it possible for everyone to participate. So that's, that's what's going on. And this is, this is happening because, you know, Polly and Cecily and Mark and Wendy Grace and, and Mark Sims and all these people, Mary and Alessandra, people have joined with us and invested in this work. They believed in us, you've believed in us. And we have worked as hard as we possibly can. And when, in the beginning we were told, well you guys don't have any history of doing policy work in, in, in California. So I don't know, you know, I, this is what people were saying a year ago in the electeds. And we were like, okay, well we've never done a project for 45 years of Christic and Romero where we didn't have to climb a mountain the first year and do all the research and figure it all out, and oh my gosh, what is this? Nuclear power, what's that? You know, everything. And so, it happened. This great team, the, the Electrify California team, has climbed this mountain. We are now known and respected by electeds. Uh, we have a very experienced lobbying firm that we have been you know, paying for every month. They're very good. We are recognized by organizations in labor, environment, and also environmental justice. We have over 140 organizations supporting the bill with us. And yeah, I mean, Yay! it's fantastic. So, the next one will be easier, because this is going to be a series of them. And each one will hopefully be a silver bullet. This is like a silver bullet, because it says, wait a minute, None of this stuff is going to work if all the people aren't participating, if the working folks are not getting labor standards and skilled labor like they need to get for decent jobs, and if we don't make it so that the incentives are strong enough for people to be able to do it, and, and we don't get the chargers everywhere. Our, our first author, uh, Senator Lamont, she and her husband, she's down in Santa Barbara, and she's in, in a Hispanic community, and she said that she and her husband had been thinking for two years to get an electric car, but there wasn't a single charger anywhere in their community, right? So if, we, if this bill passes, and I believe it's going to, um, we're talking about deadlines for a certain amount of chargers every year, build, 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 build. Who will do that? It will be the working people that put those chargers in. It'll be the electrical workers that build out the infrastructure that is the alternative to fossil fuels. And once you've got the alternative infrastructure there, then, in other words, we don't have to have a Donnybrook fight, which we've had with other, in other cases and stuff. I'm not saying we can't do it. But we don't have to do it right now. What we have to do is develop the alternative infrastructure. 
It's kind of like if you all remember when we started having organic food. You just keep building that organic food and that pretty soon you have organic food at Safeway. Or you have it someplace else. You build the positive alternative. Each one of us can find a way in our lives to build that, that alternative Electrify California and then we'll also fight together in the state legislature to get the policies in place to make it easier for everybody to do it. And we're going to go for whatever we can go for close to 10 years carbon free. I mean, that's, that is the goal. That is the goal. Um, I just, before we go on, I'm going to say a few things after he does, but we're missing three of our speakers. <laughs> It was a little bit traumatic, but it's COVID. <laughs> it's, it's COVID, people are not well. So Dolores was gonna be here, we were gonna have, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's great, we're all here together and uh, we're improvising a little bit. Okay, so everybody knows who Danny is. He's absolutely one of the most uh, brilliant legal strategists in the country. He's done all these cases, starting with the Pentagon Papers and Watergate and Karen Silkwin and stopping the nuclear power facilities from being built. Any private one was not built after 79 when we won the Karen Silkwin case. Um, he's worked with the African American community, with the Hispanic communities in the sanctuary movement cases. He's worked with labor in Idaho with, with union people who were under it's facing serious injustice, and he's worked, of course, with the Lakota People's Law Project, which is our other big project in the Dakotas, and he's the only person who has led uh, a project similar to the one he's going to be talking about in the country. So we are logically the group that should do what he's doing, because we know how to do it, and it's unusual, and it could be very helpful. Danny. Okay, I've just got a couple of minutes to do this, uh, but we're, we're gathered here today to celebrate the upward, positive, forward tactic that we're engaged in right now, constantly participating in drafting legislation, reaching out to legislators, going to meet with constituencies, organizing groups to support things, everybody going up and positive and forward to get us to zero carbon emissions here within 10 years. Now, the one that we're not really dealing with yet very effectively is, of course, the petroleum industry, uh, and the natural gas and, and uh, coal and oil industry. And the reason for that is, is because, don't kid yourself, they're never going to agree to this. Uh, all of their, you know, blathering about the going green and, you know, beyond petroleum and all that is, in fact, there's a legal term for that. Bullshit. Uh, that's total bullshit. You know, uh, it's just blah, 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 you know, uh, and there's nothing to it uh, except promo. Okay. The fact of the matter is that this uh, carrot that is being held out to all of the different citizens in our country and all of the people in the state and all the legislators is the bill. The, the uh, you know, it's uh, Senate Bill 1230. This is number one of the one, two, three. This is the one in dealing with vehicles and small trucks and stuff and building in the infrastructure, so that Sarah and Ben have explained to you. Number two is where we have to deal also with electrifying the homes, getting the solar panels put in, the, the plug-in stations at the home, the electrification of the kitchens, etc. In agriculture, of course, in this state, the huge petroleum of the, of the fossil fuel uh, source of all of their petroleum fertilizers and all. We have to deal with all of them. And then number three, we're going to have to take on the oil corporations. Because the oil corporations are going to insist upon hanging on until they kill the planet. What's really going on here is the fact is this is a major extortion operation going on. They are going to continue to poison the planet, to destroy our climactic system, until we all agree to give them a similar monopoly control over all of the alternative new sources of energy. And I know that they're going to try to bring us to the table someday, of a, right across the table, saying, do you want to stop global climate change or do you want to 
have social democracy in the country? You know, that's what they're going to say. And we know what their answer is to the second question. You know, no social democracy for this country. We're the people, as, Karen, as Sarah mentioned, who stopped the construction of all private nuclear power plants in the country because of the Karen Silkwood case. People are saying, say, what's the Christic Institute and their progeny, the Romero Institute, doing glad-handing everybody? You know, our job is the fist, to put it in their face and shut them down, okay? And that's what we're saying. We're holding out this opportunity to work on the constructive, positive, forward-leaning legislation. But we're not stupid enough to rely upon that solely. And we know that what we have to do is subsidize the ability of low and middle income people to purchase the electric vehicles. And we know that we're going to put the taxes on the corporations and the wealthiest citizens in the state in order to subsidize that. Because these people are have been engaged for the last 40 years in a flagrant criminal conspiracy to defraud the people of the country and of the world, pretending that they didn't know global climate change was being caused by their product. This is, this is just like the Pinto in the Corvair. This is just like the tobacco company that knew that they were killing people with their product and they concealed it. Uh, and when in fact it was starting to be revealed to everyone, they mounted a multi-billion dollar campaign to lie about it, to say that there's no real evidence to support global climate change. It's all very problematic. Uh, and that is a criminal activity. That is criminal fraud. And the reality is that isn't the only crime that they've been committing. They have been destroying entire villages in, in, uh, in Africa and in, in Central America, in Ecuador and in, in Nigeria. That, uh, that they, they, in fact, send out right-wing uh, death squads to kill and murder the organizers from these communities that are opposing them coming in and drilling and destroying the water in their entire community. We know that they've been doing this. They bribed the foreign government officials to allow them to come in and exploit their resources there. We know that they, they hire death squads, people like Blackwater International. I mean, we've confronted these people. Tiger Swan is an offshoot of Blackwater that we confronted in the hills of the Dakotas. These, these people are professional killers that they have put in the field against the Lakota people. You know, these are all special forces throat cutters that have been trained to kill and put into the Middle East to seize and control, control of the Middle Eastern oil fields. And they've now brought them home and they're deploying them against the indigenous people here in our country. Characterizing, characterizing the Lakota people as religiously driven, anti-capitalist, domestic jihadist terrorists in justifying the destruction of their people. An upward, positive, forward, terror. That's to take action. And remember, with, with tobacco, the, the costs to the states for all these medical problems got to the point where they couldn't stand it anymore, and so they had to go after the tobacco companies to help pay for it, if nothing else. This is going to happen. There's no way that FEMA and our state budgets are going to be able to keep paying for these crises that are going to be getting worse and worse every year. Those guys are going to have to cough up these profits, and they're going to have to go to the public interest to deal with all these crises which they have caused. It's going to be very helpful in the pressure campaign to get, uh, to get that industry to start paying for what it's done to everybody. So, as you said, a lot of um, Look, I just want to conclude before Tatanka comes up, who is our dear friend and who's, who's been, he and Carol have been uh, coordinating and running the 100 Circle uh, organizing team that has been meeting every week for months and months and months. And uh, he's going to be following me here. But before I go to, to him, I just want to leave you with this thought. Climate change is, is a moral imperative. It is an absolute moral imperative, and all of us in our souls know what that means. We did not create this planet. We did not create all of these amazing living things on this planet. 
it's birthing life every second. So far we haven't found another one like it out there. Maybe we will. But this is a remarkable place. And perhaps people from other planets come here just to get seedlings and things to take back to where they come from. We have no right to destroy this planet. No right to do it. We have to accept responsibility for the fact that we're the living people here now. It's up to us. We're the ones that are alive at the moment of truth about whether our species is going to destroy this incredible, beautiful, blue and green planet out on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. So, we, ha we have to, deep in our soul, realize we, we all have things in our lives. We have, we have things in our lives that are distractions, that are difficult, that are problems that we have to deal with, but we have to make this one of our priorities. We have to get up every day and say, okay, now what am I doing today and this week about this problem? Because it's my problem. It's everybody's problem that's alive today. And I've got to make some progress on this, or I've got to work with some other people in my neighborhood. I've got to get those panels up there. I've got to get a car that doesn't use all these fossil fuels. It's my job as a living person on this planet today. And when young people are having their children and, and grandchildren and stuff, you want them to say, you know, your ancestors did everything they could to stop this. Once they realized what it was, they did everything they could. You don't want them to say, well, I don't know, they just had other things to worry about. We have to make this a moral imperative for each one of us. Tatanka has been an organizer for all of his life, just like the rest of us. He worked with Cesar Chavez. He has contacts all over the state from his previous organizing efforts. He's been very kind to introduce us to many of them. And some of our strongest allies have come through Tatanka's connecting uh, all of us together. And we are deeply appreciative and grateful to him for everything he's done for this project and our own. Okay, so everyone here loves Danny, Sarah, and all the people working with the Romero Institute. And each one of us feels a responsibility for the future that Sarah talked about. We know it's a moral imperative. So I believe the people in this room, we all have other priorities, but we all know that if humanity has a chance of being birthed through this time, it needs the placenta intact. We need to be thinking about the environment or the baby never makes it. So the baby we're talking about is the baby that will come through the next generations. I want, I want to read something from Dolores, but basically um, she doesn't have COVID, thank God, but she's pretty sick, she's in bed, she was gonna do a video for us. She called me up, said, I just can't do it and I could hear it in her voice, but please let me write something. So I'll read it a bit later, and if I don't, I'll paraphrase what she said. So each one of us here has a different, unique ability. The money that we give Romero is basically a holding place for your love because it fuels the, the salary for, for Ben and for the legal team and I mean we can't do this work without being able to live and pay our organizers in order to do the work we all know that you're going to be handed by Anna a little thing with a little code here which the first option you can do is just scan this on your telephone if you need help there are people here at the tables to help you write a check to help you figure out how to do it on your phone we hope you will give whatever you can and then try to see if you can give more. That's the purpose of this. My job is to introduce this 
amazing painting. And although many of you will not be able to start thinking about the beginning asking, the, bid, the, the first bid that will come from this group, know that we're thinking of you too and that every single dollar counts, okay? So I just met the artist whom Anna introduced me to her partner. Um, so it's a stunning framed photograph called Portal of Light, taken off the Big Sur coast. And Robert Salisbury Knight, where are you, Robert? Right here. Put your hand up again. Stand up, Robert. Thank you so much. I mean, I didn't know of Robert until this, this opportunity. He's the recipient of multiple awards in the world's most prestigious exhibitions, including BBC Wildlife Magazine, British Natural History Museum's Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. He's been all over the earth. His journey is an amazing one. He has a, he's a local, he has a gallery in Carmel. This, this photograph starts at $7,500 when people go down to Carmel for it. This piece, in his own word, represents hope, and it's called the Portal of Light. Now, my appeal here is that we all are portals of light, and there are a few of us among us here today who could start off the bidding at $5,000. Here's the vision I see. The work we're doing is spiritual work. It's, it takes hard work, but it also takes artistry. And we welcome all the artists in our movement, right? So this is the first, but not the last, of amazing paintings, music, spoken word, theater, movies, whatever, that will assist our work over the next three years and beyond. This is just the first. On a, a, think of a bead, a, a string of beads that are each portals of light giving us all hope. So I'm looking for a person who wants to take this home and be the guardian, be the guardian of the flame, be the guardian of the light for all of us because it makes a difference for one person in our community to have this be your mesa, to have this be your altar. You get to enjoy it, yes. And yes, it's an amazing investment and holds its value, yes. But the main thing is, you're holding the intention of the Romero Institute and the Dolores Huerta Foundation as partners to give the next generations hope for life. That's what we're here for, right? So I'll say a few other things if it needs being said going on, but that's the vision that I have about this. So I would like to um, ask if there's someone here. I mean, normally you do this, you have some shield, you have somebody you know that's gonna come out with a $5,000 bid, right? And then you go back and forth. That's not this situation, folks. <laughs> we're, we're out here, we're, we're out here in faith. So who wants to bid $5,000 for this amazing painting that you can go down and see in Carmel and see the $7,500 price tag on it to get the bidding started. Cool. Woo! Mary and Alessandro, yes! Thank you so much. And have been in this position before. This was taken, as you can see, through an opening in the rocks. You've got... Is it a photograph? It's a photograph. I'm sorry, I said painting. It's a photograph. Yeah. It's an amazing photo. It, it, it's, the way the light is, it looks like a painting and it looks like there's a light behind there shining through. Three it's three-dimensional. That's right, that's right, Paul. So it's an amazing inspiration for all of us. Who else out there wants to bid 6,000? Anybody out here, 6,000? It's still undervalued for what you can, uh, you know, what it can go for. Down in Carmel. Okay, you got it. You want to bid against yourself? No. <laughs> okay. Go. 
Yeah, 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 six, seven. <laughs> I mean, we want to give it fair value. She been on it. Oh, okay, Alessandro. Five thousand one. <laughs> Five thousand and one. Do I hear six thousand and one? <laughs> okay, going once. Oh yes. Six thousand. Six thousand. Thank you. All right. We have two people in the in the process here. Do I hear 6,500? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 6,500. <laughs> How about that? Do I hear 7,000? 7,000, Alessandro. All right. <laughs> Okay, do I hear 7,500? <laughs> Going once. Going twice. Sold. <laughs> Thank you, Alessandro and Mary. $10,000. Peter Romero Institute. Woo! So, let me check. It. I have to admit that one of the one of my greatest pleasures in the last two years was introducing the woman who introduced me to community organizing, Dolores Huerta, to Danny and Sarah. It's just been an amazing partnership. And I, wa I want to invite all of you, those of you that don't know, we have a Wednesday night, Circle of 100. If you're interested, talk to myself or Carol, will you stand up? It's my partner, Carol Wallenstein. You can talk to either of us to get on the mailing list, um, the email list. We meet with Danny, Sarah, Dolores, Heidi, Ben, and uh, at least half or more of those show up every time. And we're working, in, it's a group of volunteers totally dedicated to the vision of Romero and the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Dolores Huerta, who founded the Farm Workers Union with Cesar Chavez, and worked with him her entire life has been the head of thank you so much has been the head of the Dolores Huerta Foundation based in Bakersfield where she lives Bakersfield in the Central Valley mo many of you know but maybe not all of you know is also known as the Selma of California the place where slavery of farm workers has existed for a you know, hundred years or more and she works there and they have nearly 50 employees now, and uh, they work on empowerment, on community organizing there, and they brought, in full partnership with the Romero Foundation, um, to work on this bill and the bills to come. And it's been, it's been an amazing partnership. Dolores is the inspiration of my life, and I know for many of us. She gets on that call, and she's like a 16-year-old. She's 92, you know putting us all to shame, you know, I mean, she's really energetic. The work of the Romero Institute to stop global warming is seeing fruition right now with Senate Bill 1230 to electrify California. We are blessed to have Danny Sheehan, Sarah Nelson, and the Romero team take on this tremendous issue to save human health and life. The Central Valley of California has the worst air pollution in the country that affects farm workers and their children with many types of illnesses like asthma and even their mental health. Thanks to everyone who supports this important effort to help us in this movement. Working together, we can save our human species on Mother Earth. Si se puede. Everybody together. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Yes, we can. Thank you, Dolores. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Keep donating. Hang around, but make a donation. I just, I just wanted to uh, add a little thing here for because it sometimes helps people. Um, we are in terms of our priorities for the Electrify California project, we must hire two people, like yesterday, 
One is an environmental justice organizer for the entire state, and the other one is a labor organizer for the entire state. They have to be experienced, they have to be really good in order to do the job that is ahead of us. Um, that's why we're raising money for Electrify California right now. Uh, we also have to renew our contribution to the group that is coordinating our internship program, which produces, like we have eight interns right now, eight people who are young, who are working on this and learning themselves what it all means and helping us move this forward. So all of you who contribute, just realize that those are the kinds of steps you're going to make possible for us to move forward. And you guys, what can I say? You're so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We're not in the habit of, you know, constantly asking people for money. What we do is try to tell you what it is we're doing and assume that you want to help on this. But it would really be helpful if you could, you know, fill out this thing here uh, so that we can have some idea by the end of today, while well, well, they're getting ready to vote on the bill in the Senate, you know, uh, what we're going to have for finances to be able to move into the assembly on this thing. So uh, I, I'm not going to do this thing of here, raise your hands and tell me how much you'll contribute, but how about somebody raise their hand and uh, tell us what you're going to contribute? Uh, so, yes. <laughs> Five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. Yes. Another five hundred dollars. Okay. Another five hundred dollars. Seven thousand to match all the Seven thousand dollars. All right. All right. Yes. No, that's right. Re re reconsider. What what would you like to? Four thousand dollars. Three thousand dollars. Okay, just calling. Five thousand dollars. Okay. Yes. Five thousand additional dollars. I want somebody identifying the folks so that we can get it. <laughs> I was going to say, okay, now we, now we know. Okay, uh, anybody else, please. Uh, another, another contribution just before we close. Of any amount. Pardon? Of any amount. Yeah, any amount. So, so just so we... One, yes. One thousand. Thousand. One more thousand dollars. Okay. That's not, that's not as, to, as an alternative for people filling out and sending it in to us. I just wanted to let everybody show the kind of support we have here so you have some idea of how what a nice community you're part of. Okay. Thank you very... Yes. So, okay. That's right. Five hundred dollars a month. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, look at everybody. Go get some more food. We've still got more food and drinks and stuff like that. We got to get some of the uh, senior citizens back to their home. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll continue to do the work. We're all here in this thing together. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.